On October 21st, 2021, a Western movie entitled Rust was being filmed in Bonanza Creek, New Mexico. It was a low budget independent film, but the star of the movie was an A-lister, Alec Baldwin. Baldwin was not only starring in the film, he was also an executive producer. The person in charge of the firearms on the set was the armorer, Hannah Gutierrez. Hannah was only 24 years old, and this was only the second film she had been hired as the armorer in charge of the guns and ammo. One other crew member had access to the weapons and ammunition on the set, prop master Sarah Zachary. On that day, October 21st, Alec Baldwin was rehearsing a scene with a cross draw, and while rehearsing, the gun went off. The bullet struck cinematographer Helena Hutchins and director Joel Souza. Joel survived, but Helena did not. There are a lot of questions that remain unanswered about exactly what happened that day. Where did the live ammo come from? Who loaded it? And did Alec Baldwin pull the trigger? The state is wrapping up its evidence in the first trial against Hannah Gutierrez, and tonight we will examine the evidence and try to figure out where that live round came from and see who is telling the truth as we continue to investigate the Baldwin movie shooting. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And there's one thing that has really surprised me, and I wonder if it has surprised you at home is figuring out where the ammo came from on this movie set is not so easy. I, I, I don't know, I had this perception that on a movie set, like if you ever walk by when they're filming something and there's people stopping you and there's a million people with headsets and clipboards and they seem very, very organized. And I always had that perception. And, and I thought when this first happened that it was going to be a very quick investigation. That it would be easy to figure out, okay, where did the ammunition come from, who was in charge of it, where was it, when was it loaded, all those questions. I thought, straightforward. That's really not, not so easy. That's what we're finding out here. And I don't know if this is what it's like on every movie set or just this one. Now, what we do know is Hannah Gutierrez was in charge of the guns, right? That was her job. Now, she had another job. She was rolling cowboy cigarettes and doing other work uh, for props, which to me little confusing it's a western it's a western lots of guns and you have one 24 year old and you're going to give her responsibilities above and beyond the safety of everyone on that set to me that makes no sense at all but ultimately she was the one in charge and that's one of the reasons why she has been charged in this case um sarah zachary is someone else who has testified here the prop master but also maybe an assistant armorer and also had her hands on the ammo and contacted the supplier in this case. So she's in the middle of all this as well. You got Hannah Gutierrez, yes. She's supposed to be in charge, but you got um, Sarah Zachary also in the, you know, if this was a trial, we're talking about a piece of evidence, we talk about chain of custody, right? That's why chain of custody is so important in the trials we covered, that the evidence goes from point A to point, to point D, and you gotta know where it stops in between. Well, that's part of the problem in this case. It's, it's not super clear, not so easy. Um, Seth Kenny was on, on the stand today as well. We met him, we've heard a lot of testimony about him. Um, and the question is, did he provide all the ammo here? Or was it coming from other places as well? Again, going into all this, I thought it was gonna be a very simple, very, very simple, uh, investigation. I would have thought everything would be documented and organized and kept in safe places uh, and that chain of custody would be very easy to track. Here, nothing is easy to track. Everything is complicated and convoluted. The more you hear people testify, the more people that testify, the more convoluted it gets. And to me, that, that speaks volumes about the set. But I don't know, is this the way all movies are? Or is it because it's a low budget movie? Is it because we have an inexperienced armor? Is it because uh, they're in a rush to finish this movie? These are all questions that the jury has to go through and figure out. Because we're not talking about a case of murder where did they plan, did they plot? No, it's a case of were they so reckless, 
so reckless in their behavior that they should be held criminally responsible for the death of Helena Hutchins. Okay, so another big day, as I've mentioned today, inside the courtroom. Let's take a look at some of those big moments. These were additional rounds that were located at PDQ that had silver and color primers. And um, are the head stamps the same as the, as the live rounds found on the set of rest? No. This was a photo of dummy ammunition that was located at PDQ. Now, when you say it was dummy ammunition, did you send these to the FBI lab? No, we did not. And did you actually uh, seize those and take them to the sheriff's office? No. You took a picture and you uh, concluded they were dummies without getting lab confirmation, is that right? Yes. Did the search warrant let you take from that property anything you wanted to? No, it had restrictions. What were the restrictions of the warrant? We were looking specifically for live ammunition. Did anything unusual happen when you left Ms. Gutierrez's room? Yes, she asked me if I could hold on to something for her. I said yes, she put it in my hand, and I walked out as there was a knock on the door. Describe, without making any assumptions about what it was, can you just describe what you saw in your hand? Yes. It was a clear Ziploc baggie with a green small Ziploc baggie inside, and there was powder inside the green baggie. What color was the powder? White. How did you know it was live, and how were you able to keep it separate from dummies and blanks? Well, it's, it's, it's obviously, it, it's a concern. Anytime you've got these things in, let's just say, one structure. Um, and in this instance, always better to keep live ammunition near blanks rather than dummy rounds, because dummy rounds and live ammunition can look exactly the same. Did you provide 45 long Colt dummy rounds to the set of rust? I did. I supplied a single box of, uh, of 50. I have never sent out any dummy round that doesn't rattle. Whether or not the primer has been struck by a firing pin. So even if we're talking about, well, we can assume that because the firing pin has hit the primer, it must be a dummy round and there's nothing in it, and that is definitely not the case. There are a number of instances where hard primers will not go off with just one hit of a firing pin. And so, we, and we don't know that that's a purpose-built dummy round. Unless it rattles, it's not to be trusted. You made a statement on cross-examination uh, that you didn't want to work, I think it was in a text message maybe, that you didn't want to work with uh, Ms. Gutierrez in the future. Is that correct? Do you recall yeah. making that statement? Yeah. I'd okay. Say yes. um, why didn't you want to work with her in the future? The issue of uh, loading a full load blank with a, with a horse in the, in the vicinity is a huge violation of an armor's work. Let's bring in Core TV legal correspondent Kelly Kraft, who is live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, outside the courthouse, was inside the courtroom today. Kelly, thank you so much. Great to see you. Okay, the big question, right? This is, I thought it would be easy, but now I understand why this investigation took so long. Who was providing the dummies to the Rust film set? And Vinny, we had some answers to that very question today. The answer is a lot of people. So Seth Kenny on the stand today, he testified that dummies were hard to come by and you had to reach out to other suppliers to get them. Now he did testify that he supplied one box of Colt 45 revolver dummies 
to the set of Rust. He also talked about Hannah Gutierrez, the defendant in this case, and how she brought, according to him, dummies from another movie that she had worked on previously called The Old Way. Also, we heard the name Billy Ray as a supplier of some of the ammunition on the movie set of Rust. Let's listen to some of Seth Kenny's testimony. Based on uh, State's Exhibit 175, was it your impression uh, that Ms. Gutierrez was bringing dummy rounds that were already loaded into gun belts? Absolutely. Not only that, but we were counting on it. What do you mean you were counting on it? Because there were there, you know, everything else from PDQ was slated for 1883. Uh, in fact, it, some of it wasn't even manufactured yet. So there was just no inventory. And the only way that she was, they were going to have you know, dummy rounds on rust is by reaching out to other suppliers in the business and they needed them straight away. And Billy Ray happens to be in Albuquerque. So that's a, that's a straight away solution. Okay, was it, was it your understanding from that conversation with Ms. Gutierrez that the dummy rounds that she was providing to the set of rust were left over from the old way. Yes. And Vinny, we've heard a lot about JS, these initials that were on this box of dummy rounds. Seth Kenny, he did talk about that today on the stand. Let's listen to what he had to say about that. Have you ever had a box of dummies from Mr. Swanson with that label? No, never. And why would you not have a box with this label if you're sourcing your dummy rounds from Mr. Swanson? Well, 1883 was the first period show that, um, that I needed uh, 45 long cold dummy rounds for. Uh, prior to that, even though we had done flash, a flashback scene with Tim McGraw and Yellowstone, th there was no call for dummy rounds or the prop master sourced them elsewhere. Um, so I, I just never needed them. And when I did, it was I needed them by the thousands, not by boxes of 50. And so what happened is uh, Joe Swanson, he asked me, do you want me to package them up? I said, no, there's no point. Yeah, it's more work for everybody. So he uh, uh, sent them to me in bulk. Okay, and so you never had anything like this in your possession? Never. And Vinny, I also want to note on cross-examination, Jason Bulls asked him a lot of questions and he had a lot of responses, which included, I don't recall, I don't remember that. So that was interesting to watch the testimony of him today and see the jurors taking notes, especially as they themselves are trying to figure out exactly who all brought this ammunition onto the set of Rust. Yeah, I think the jury wants to know. The jury wants to figure this out. And as I said off the top, it's, it's not super clear because everyone will be in CYA mode, right? I, it wasn't me. It wasn't, okay, look over there. Don't look at me. Um, okay, so things were wrapping up for the, the state today in their prosecution. So who was their final witness? Yes, Vinny, the state did rest today. Michael Primo, he was the final witness. And although listening to the testimony, especially because he was the last witness for the state, it was a little bit slow moving. He did show some visuals that were pretty interesting to see. So he analyzed some of the photos and enlarged them. And we were really able to see some of this ammunition, how it was in Alec Baldwin's bandolier and also on the lap of Hannah Gutierrez. Let's listen to some of his testimony. The date that the metadata interpretation tool is reporting as the date time the original image was captured is October 10th, 2021 at approximately 9 a.m. 42, 11 seconds. And Vinny, although his testimony was really important today, Seth Kenny, of course, was an extremely important witness for the state and for defense counsel because defense counsel is trying to point the finger at everyone else except, of course, his client, saying that she is not the one that brought the live ammunition on the set. Seth Kenny made it very clear on the, set, on the stand when he was asked that he 
too, did not provide the live ammunition on the movie set of Rust. Well, we know somebody did. No one's owning up to it, obviously, but somebody did. Exactly. Kelly Craft in Santa Fe, New Mexico. We will speak again tomorrow. I want to bring in a special guest uh, joining us tonight in Los Angeles, California. Director, producer, and friend of Helena Hutchins. Uh, Rachel Mason is with us. Uh, Rachel is currently working on a documentary about Helena Hutchins' life called Helena. Um, great to have you with us, uh, Rachel. Appreciate it. Um, for someone who never met your friend Helena, how would you describe her? Well, thank you. I would describe her as a dynamo. She was just a humongous, enormous ball of energy and ideas and creativity and joy. And everyone that worked with her pretty much universally wanted to continue working with her. Um, that is just, she brought everything to every single project. And um, she was committed a thousand percent to everything she did and showed up with millions of ideas and had her hand in every single part of a film i mean much more than just a typical cinematographer the the passion that she had for her work so when she's not making films what would take up helena's time what, what would she do well, she loved nature, absolutely loved it. And, you know, my experience with her is often tied to going hiking with our kids. Um, she has a son and I have a son the same age. And we would go um, to all kinds of different places in, you know, the areas around LA where there's nature. And also, you know, um, when I went back to New Mexico this last week, I met some of the horse wranglers that worked with her and she fell in love with riding horses actually while she was on the set of Rust. And um, she just absolutely loved the animals and the people. Um, she just really indulged, I would say, in life and enjoyed all the different people she met along the way. What a great way to describe it, indulging in life. Um, mm -hmm. How important was this film that she was working on, Rust? Well, as I've started to really understand, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you have to start looking, you know, she's a friend of mine, but I started to look at her in a more research way. Like what, what was she doing, you know, as a subject of a film that I could look at? And I realized every single film she made had a significance. And from this little teeny tiny, you know, experimental art film that she would work on with me. Those were some of the things we did to indie feature films that were labors of love. I mean, she really chose projects very specifically and she didn't randomly choose projects. She was really deliberate and I think she loved directors. So every director she worked with was really also a very deliberate decision. And I think no doubt she loved working with Joel and he clearly had a passion and a vision, and I, I could see immediately that they had a bond. Now, you mentioned that you went to New Mexico, you went to Santa Fe, you went, you were there inside the courtroom. How important was it for you to be there for Helena? Well, I, I only realized how important it was when I actually got there. I wanted to see it for myself, and then as soon as I, entered the courtroom with my producing partner, Julie, we were ushered into this very sort of sanctified position at the front of the courtroom. And then we were told that we had, you know, we were the only people that had been present for Helena. And I was really surprised by that. I hadn't really thought it through, but it became so remarkable to me that our presence was the only presence up until that point of people that knew and loved Helena um, to just be present in the courthouse. Uh, I, I understand it's it's remote. It's not where she lived. I, I'm not sure where her family is or what they how they even feel about this. You know, I speak with so many families of victims, and some absolutely need to be and want to be there, and some don't want to be anywhere close to a courtroom. So I'm sure that's something that they're um, certainly wrangling with. Uh, and before I go, so what, what was your final takeaway from the whole scene at that courthouse and, and what you experienced? I mean, it was really powerful for me to see in person and, you know, the, hear the various testimony of people that I had not yet met um, in person. And without question, every single person that I met, um, as soon as they understood who I was, just was very moved uh, by my presence. And again, I wasn't, I wasn't aware until that moment that 
people at the center of this horrible nightmare, I think really do want to connect with people that knew and loved Helena. And, um, you know, I could feel the depth of the pain of, of each and every person that I met um, who gave testimony bravely. I had a feeling just how brave it was to go up there. I don't think people realize you know, watching a court trial that to get all the way up to the front of a room where everyone's staring at you and you have to swear and take an oath, it's very lonely and it's very isolating. So being there and making eye contact with people that knew me and knew who I was, um, I wore this bracelet, which is Helena's actual bracelet. And I also wore this hat, um, which she wore on the set of Rust. Um, and people, many of whom, you know, worked with her, recognized immediately the hat. Um, I had to take it off and kept it in my lap. But. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Rachel Mason. We look forward to seeing your documentary, Helena, and we can learn a lot more about um, her life. And uh, you really are a great friend and I think gave us a great glimpse into what we are missing um, tonight with, with her, her being no longer being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vinny. All right, folks, when we come back, we're going to get back to the live round. Where did it come from? We're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. Plus, coming up next hour. In Kissimmee, Florida, the tragic murder of 13-year-old Madeline Soto. Tonight, we take a look at the evidence against her mother's boyfriend. Is there enough for murder charges? We have the latest. We believe she was already dead at the time and that Stephen Stearns moved her body in the early morning hours on that day. I'm the armor. Or at least I was. A famous actor in a movie set accident that ended in tragedy. I turn and come because the gun goes off. Now Alec Baldwin and the film's armorer have both been charged with involuntary manslaughter. Just because it's an accident doesn't mean that it's not criminal. Court TV takes you inside the courtroom as Hannah Gutierrez faces a jury. The Baldwin movie shooting trial. Live coverage weekday mornings. Only on Court TV. In terms of dummy rounds, we understand that you provided some and we've looked at those photos. You've testified that Billy Ray provided some and you've explained that to us. Was there anyone else who provided 45 long cult dummy rounds to the set of Rust? Yes. Who's that? That was Hannah. And if you know where did Ms. Gutierrez say that she got the dummy rounds from that she took on to the set of Rust? It was the same supply uh, that she had gotten from Thale uh, that she used on the old way. What an important witness. And, you know, I said this all the time, it's just not easy figuring out where this live round came from. People, all these different people are supplying dummies and Things didn't seem that organized on the set, to say the least. And obviously, no one's going to own up to it. No one's owning up to it. So let's take a listen to more testimony from Seth Kenny, who's an ammunition and prop supplier. And again, the, the key is look at what he's saying, listen to what he's saying, how he's saying it. Is this guy covering something, uh, or is he being truthful on the stand? Will the jury believe him? Take a listen. Let's talk about the... Um dummy rounds that you provided to the set of rust did you provide 45 long colt dummy rounds to the set of rust i did i supplied a single box of uh of 50 on october 12th and the where did those dummy rounds come from they had just come off of the day prior um, from the prop truck in Texas uh, from 1883. And I looked at these overly antiqued eight um, rounds that had been dipped in a chemical uh, that patinaed not only the lead bullets, but also the cases very heavily, too heavily. And they didn't look right. They didn't look right for camera. So I just sat there and decided, well, I'll just see what it looks like after I polish them up with some quato steel wool. And that's what I did. What I realized, though, too, is that some of the chemicals seem to have leaked into the case, and some of the rattles seem muddy. Um, and 
What do you mean when you say some of the rattles seemed muddy? Well, it's uh, we Joe Swanson for the most part stopped using BBs inside the dummy rounds because the uh, the cam the uh, the sound guys could hear them on camera. So if the gun is being manipulated, he could actually hear the dummy rounds rattling around. And there's a number of instances where I can hear dummy rounds in TV and and in movies um, where I can spot it and I'm like, oh, you can hear the dummy rounds rattling. It's kind of interesting. So he switched to using a single piece of number two lead shot, which is an adequate rattle, but it's a little bit muffled. And I, and I suspect what had happened is the chemical had caused some kind of gooey layer to my best guess. And so I noticed that some of the, they just didn't sound safe to me. It, they just didn't sound like I wanted, you know, Hannah and Sarah to have to be dealing with something that seems odd. And so I selected, um, before I sat there and polished each dummy round, I had to make sure, one, it rattled before I spent a minute polishing around. If we're talking about a box of 50, plus writing a label on both ends, I sat there with this box for an hour. So they got rattled before they got polished, polished and then re-rattled to make sure they, you know, they would rattle without issue. And then individually inserted into the box. That is the box of dummy rounds that I supplied to, um, to Sarah Zachary uh, on October 12th. Wow. That's a, it just sounds very dangerous. Like it's a muffled rattle. Like what, what's going on out in Hollywood? All right. Joining me tonight in Los Angeles, California prop master armor and the author of Prop Gun Safety for Film and TV, needed on the set of Rust, Dutch Merrick is with us. In Falls Church, Virginia, former special agent supervisor with the Department of Homeland Security, Dr. Jason Piccolo. And in Alexandria, Virginia, body language expert, author of the New York Times bestselling book, You Can't Lie to Me, and creator of the new free, did you hear me, free newsletter in the driver's seat, Janine Driver is with us. Thank you everyone for being here. Dutch, I, I want to begin with you on these these alternative dummies. We're not putting BBs in. Is it, how un, like how unusual is this that we're talking about dummies that aren't obvious and 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 perhaps getting mixed up with some live rounds make things kind of difficult. If you're if you're shaking some that don't have BBs in them, maybe you shake one and you, maybe you thought you heard something, maybe you didn't. Like this is this is danger. Well, I wouldn't call it dangerous. You know, you've got to figure the most common practice for us with dummy rounds now is to put a little BB in it or a little ball of shot so that it rattles. And it has happened on shows in the past where uh, a cowboy is walking around with a six shooter and he's got six dummy rounds in there and they're rattling and they're making enough sound that the sound department notices it. So one alternative I've heard some shows using is a heavy, a heavy grain sand in there so that it shakes around very different than gunpowder. Um, so it's a weird workaround. It's kind of an anomaly that a six shooter full of dummies like that, I would think I would put dummies in there that just had holes drilled in the side and I'd be done with it. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. So I, that's a bit of a, a tangent, I think, really. But how is it that Seth uh, Kenny can't even remember when he brought the rounds all the way from Texas? Like he made a trip from Texas to New Mexico and he said he went through all of his records and he can't find any record of it. He has no idea when he brought those yeah. rounds there. And there's so, a few things, a few notes that I have. But. Yeah, we're going we're, we're gonna to play that for everyone in just a second. Um, Janine Driver, what did you think of Seth Kenny as a witness? What you just saw and heard there? Is this a guy just telling the folks on the jury what he remembers? Listen, you know, sometimes it's a slam dunk for my opinion saying like this guy is telling the truth or this woman's lying. And for me, I'm not there yet, Vinny. I, you know, I have to I have to rewatch it over and over again because here's the deal. Sometimes I feel like he's being authentic and telling us the truth. Other times I feel like he's withholding back information. And we're seeing that with his eye movements changing. And we're also seeing that with some eye blocking that's happening. And then he does some interesting moves with his mouth that hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about tonight that sometimes it means nothing much, like Karen Reed, right? Karen Reed over in Massachusetts being charged with murder potentially, right? Uh, she does a similar face to what we're seeing here with Seth. However, we're looking at the context and we're looking at clusters and the cluster of the eye movement with a certain mouth gesture he's making, the same face that Karen Reed made, makes 
but it's different here because there's a disconnect. Let's take a listen now to uh, what Dutch was uh, uh, referencing. Seth Kenny here talking about um, not remembering everything. You did retain some of the reloaded live rounds after 1883 completed. After the 1883 cowboy training camp, yes. And those then made their way back to Albuquerque, you've said, to PDQ props, correct? Yes. And you don't know whether... Those returned, I think you've stated before October 21st. You said you were hazy on the date, right? Yes. But we do know that you came back to Albuquerque from 1883 on or about October 11th uh, because you met with Sarah Zachary October 12th, correct? Correct. So when you came back, you brought dummy rounds from the set of 1883 to give to Sarah, correct? Correct. And those were 45 long Colt dummy rounds. Correct. Now, you had a whole group of dummies in 1883. Was How many do you think there were? 5,000. Okay. So out of those 5,000, you brought some back from Miss Zachary. Um, and at some point, you can't tell the jury when, those live rounds came back to your place. I've never been able to identify the exact date. Well, you also said on direct, they were delivered back, uh, let me get you the words you used. They were offloaded from your Sprinter van and got moved back to Albuquerque in the bathroom. Is that mm -hmm. right? That's correct. Now, when you said got moved, isn't that you who moved them back? Yes. Okay. So, in reality, you drove them back from 1883 and you can't remember that date at all. No, I, I ballpark it, but it's not. It's not accurate. I, I, can, I have an idea of of within months or two, or even did you know? I can't. I can't tell you because I made at least two trips back and forth um, from Texas to Albuquerque, California, back again. It's. I've just not been able to, to narrow it down. Dr. Jason Piccolo, I'm a little upset here because you're talking about live rounds, dummy rounds. You don't know everything. I mean, it could it, mistakes can be made, and it just seems like it's very possible here if you're not keeping track of the lives and the dummies. It's almost like a chain of custody. Now, when he was talking about going from point A to point B and point B to point C, point D to point E, and he doesn't understand when those trips were, well, he, he mentioned he only took two trips. Now, me, when I just took a trip actually to a firearms course in Georgia, now I keep track of all my receipts. So could he not, prior to this testimony, go and retrieve the receipts and understand when, in fact, he did go there and there? The other thing, too, is with these boxes of ammunition, he should be able to mark them he marked the one dummy round. You can see that to fit the box of 50 dummies. How come he didn't mark the lives? Like maybe even wrap them with, with red tape or something. But he's the only one in that chain of custody that I see that he admits to that held that ammo from point A to point B. Unbelievable. All right, our guests are staying where they are. We just got to get a quick break in. When we come back, we'll take a look at more of Seth's testimony and compare it to Sarah Zachary. Remember the disposal of those rounds after the shooting? Are they telling the truth? Uh, what you did is you threw away rounds from two revolvers, is that correct? Correct. And that was right, uh, that was after the shooting, correct? Yes. Now, after the shooting, do you recall how many minutes uh, went by, just roughly, before you threw away those rounds? I don't recall. In that time frame, you also had a conversation with Seth Kenny, correct? Yes. And on that conversation, you had texted him previously before that and said emergency? After the incident, yes. How long did that phone call last? Um, as I said yesterday, possibly 30 seconds, a minute. So then in that time frame, you then throw, throw rounds away 
from the two revolvers that you had previously loaded, right? I believe so, yes. So the two revolvers that you loaded, again, were uh, the Jensen Ackles revolver, right? Mm -hmm. And then this Sven? Uh, Swen. Swen. How do you say his name? Swen. Okay, Swen. So those two revolvers, you threw the rounds away from? Yes. And you threw them in a trash can? Correct. Now, you didn't tell anybody uh, at the scene that you had thrown those away, right? I didn't tell anyone, but it was in a public place. If someone saw me, then yeah. Well, um, did, you didn't want to let anybody know that, did you? I, they weren't the rounds in question, so I didn't think it mattered, and I had honestly forgotten. Well, you knew that, that somebody had been shot, at least one person had been shot, correct? Correct. You knew that 911 had been called, is that right? Uh, I didn't hear anybody call 911, but I had assumed. And you would have assumed that the police would have to respond to a shooting, correct? Sure. All right, let's bring back in our guest. This was crucial testimony, throwing out rounds. What, what is going on here? Janine Driver, what did you see from Sarah Zachary? Well, the tone and pitch goes down. I don't have her baseline, but this soft speaking is indicative of someone who has sadness. We also ha see some sadness on her face. Interestingly, though, for someone so soft-spoken, she leaks a little bit of contempt, which is interesting to me, which is moral superiority. It's as, as if she's justifying her actions. It's not overly overt, but we see it on the right side of her face, left side of our screen for you looking at home. The other thing about what's happening here is we see no increase in eye blinking and no stress in the in the head or anything, that, that sadness, dimpling of the chin. But the big one for me is when she says she didn't tell anyone, she shoulder shrugs. Now, a shoulder shrug is uncertainty, right? So she, this is a shoulder shrug. Vinny, what do you want for dinner? You know, where are you DJing next, Vinny? What, what weekend are you DJing next, right? And Vinny goes, Janine, I can't talk to you about that stuff, right? This is uncertainty. I don't know. I'm waiting to close the deal. So uncertainty doesn't belong here. If, in fact, she didn't tell anyone, it's a really easy question. No, I didn't tell anyone. If so, then we could shrug. If yeah, people saw me, then maybe they saw me. But she shrugs when saying she didn't tell anybody, and this is a hot spot for me. Absolutely. All right. Let's take a listen to Seth Kenny now describe that same conversation with Sarah Zachary. And Sarah was technically your employee um, of PDQ Props, correct? Sure. She was the representative of PDQ for the rest production. And she's the one that, that called you right after the shooting incident. You all talked for 30 seconds to a minute. Is that right? It was a very quick conversation, yes. And you, your testimony under oath is that you did not tell her to throw any of those rounds away. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. But then she did throw them away. I learned about that months later. Okay. And did you know that guns had been transported from the cart? <clears throat> Did you? No. Did you tell her to do that? No. Okay. Did you train Sarah before she worked on Rust? I did. And you trained her in, in what, in gun safety or what? Yeah, the basics of, of using uh, blank adapted guns and, um, and blanks and dummy rounds uh, on a set. And I take it you never trained her to throw away dummy rounds after a scene? Oh. Well, I don't recall that conversation or even indicating at what point you would want to throw away dummy rounds. Because they're rented, right? <clears throat> they are rented. All right, Dutch Merrick, give me your, your take on Seth Kenny today and the significance of what he said or didn't say. Well, there's a sharp contrast between Sarah Zachary and Seth Kenny. Sarah Zachary threw away a dozen dummy rounds on the day of the shooting, and when asked by Jason Bowles, had you ever thrown away dummy rounds before? Sure, I have. Dummy rounds are an asset. They're owned by the production or the rental company, and they have to go back or they have to be paid for. You don't throw them away. She, in fact, had to have a trip down to Albuquerque, an hour-long trip to get a precious box of 50 rounds because they were in such demand. They couldn't get enough. Now, Seth Kenny says the other show he's working on had 5,000 dummy rounds. So this precious box of 50 rounds, she's just throwing them away regularly. There's some real inconsistency in those two stories. And Seth, it seems that he has led the prosecution around from the very beginning. 40 phone calls to the investigator, 
by Seth, and he makes sure to be there at the truck so he can lend a hand and be there to advise them. I think he's been advising them away from himself this entire time. Yeah, Dr. Jason Piccolo, that's such a great observation. Someone, um, because someone, someone is responsible for injecting that live round into this sea of dummy rounds. And, and as we sit here tonight, it's just not, it's not so easy to figure it out. Now, if we backtrack to a last segment where he was talking about how some of the rounds could be gooed up and they could not make that sound and that he took that box of 50 himself and made them polished up and ready for that. Such a precious commodity. And then he also, you know, just loses track of it. The other thing too he mentioned was the training that he gave the prop. What kind of training? I'd like to know what that is. And, and one of those 40 phone calls that he mentioned what type of training he gave them, gave her basic firearm safety or did he give her more in depth how to spot dummy rounds how to spot a live round how to spot a primer in the back of the round there's there's a lot of questions when it comes to his testimony uh janine drive we have about a minute left here um your final analysis of seth kenny and denying that he had any conversation about throwing away dummy rounds in the last in the last clip you showed he leaked disgust there when he said he found out those rounds were thrown out you see that nose wrinkling happening here lots are happening with here with his mouth and this is what's happening his mouth is stretching occasionally like this and when our mouth stretches it's we're afraid we may have made a mistake another time though he does some pursing of his lips this is i disagree with what's being said or i'm thinking of an alternative and this is what i was talking about with karen reed karen reed does this cursing of the lips, but when she does it, it's congruent with someone who's telling the truth. Here, it's congruent with someone who's holding something back. And Dutch America, I'll give you the final word here. We have about 20 seconds. Um, comparing what we're learning about what happened on this set versus other productions. Is this extremely unusual and outrageous what we're hearing? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, Seth Kenny recommended Hannah Gutierrez Reed to be the armorer on the show after her her very first time was her last, her previous film, where there were two negligent discharges. If that is an evidence that maybe she's not up to the task, so he put his reputation on recommending her for this job, and the way it was run, it was it was not run as a normal set at Unbelievable. all. Unbelievable. Dutch Merrick, appreciate your time today. Great to see you, Dr. Jason Piccolo and Janine Driver. We'll see you again really, really soon.